Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And this is uh, the third in a series of programs that we are doing uh, about uh, the comm- commemoration of the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers in New York City uh, and an event that will be held at the Beverly Airport. My guest is Mark Foster. Hi. Mark, welcome. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks may not be aware that the Beverly uh, team, the Massachusetts Task Force Number 1 Urban Search and Rescue, was the first federal emergency management team to arrive in New York City at Ground Zero. And we've already talked in general about that situation that day, and we talked about how uh, Mark and his team got down to Ground Zero and how they were transported down. And today we're going to talk a little bit about something which was probably a nightmare for these folks, and that's communicating and, 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 and communicating with people, letting people know what you're doing and, and finding out what they're doing. And we have with us uh, Charlie Dunn, and Charlie is a communications specialist who uh, worked for the uh, Mass Task Force One at that time and is still there, correct? In a part-time capacity okay. now. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, yeah. welcome. Well, we really get in trouble. Yeah. Charlie comes in and rescues us. <laughs> well, uh, welcome, Charlie. Thank you for, for being good with to us. Good be here. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the question I always ask, we've, we already asked Mark uh, what he was doing and where he was when, he, when, the, when the planes hit the towers or when he found out. And, and Charlie, maybe you can tell us where, where you were when you first heard. Well, I was actually over at the site. Uh, Everybody will tell you, beautiful day, fall day. I was over there getting some stuff together. I was working on my old truck. I was getting some stuff together to do some sandblasting on the frame of my truck. And uh, one of the guys who's no longer with us, Mike Bookman, came driving by me and he said, did you hear a plane hit the World Trade Center? And I said, well, what kind of plane? He said, oh, a small plane. Yeah. Nothing to worry about. And so over the next half hour, we were in watching the TV, and we realized what had happened. And so. yeah. Now, you're, you're, tell us, what was the general scope of your responsibilities at the, that time uh, at, at the, at the uh, task force number one? Well, at that time, uh, on the communications side, uh, I was responsible for making sure that the radios worked, the radio systems worked, that we picked channels that would work, programming radios, along with Bill Yee, who can't be with us, um, telephones. We had telephones that we took with us, as well as radios. Uh, I, also, I also did mechanical work if we had trouble with trucks and so on. Kind of anything, but my main responsibility was communications, radio and telephone. Yeah. So, so in a general sense, tell us, here you, you're going to a, a spot where uh, lines have been severed, t- you know, th- th- uh, buildings have, have crashed down. So what, what, what were the, 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 the biggest challenges as a communications person that you, that you thought you'd encounter when, when you got down there? Well, of course, we didn't know what to expect. Um, going down there, it's like, what are we going to find down there? Are there going to be more bombs? What's, you know, the idea that all the telephone lines were down, there was no power, I actually hadn't even thought about how widespread that was going to be. Or where we were going to be, you know, sleeping and stationed as opposed to working. And of course, we were at the Javits Center, which is on the West Side, West Side Drive. Yes. Yeah. Um, what, a couple miles from Ground Zero. And so the immediate need that came there is how are we going to communicate? We've got, we've got guys in dangerous locations down there, Ground Zero, carrying radio portables. How are we going to communicate with them? How are they going to let us know if they're in trouble? How are we going to get them things? So that was the first thing was to establish that. There was no communications down there. Cell phones were all dead in the area of Ground Zero. Yeah. So we had to build something from scratch. Yeah. And also tell us, um, give us an idea, uh, technology in, in today in, in whatever field you're talking about, technology changes so rapidly, yeah. and in communications it certainly does. So what were some of the main things? Take us back 20 years uh, uh, ago and tell us, what, what, what did you not have that you, that you have now that you take for granted? Well, well, now we have broadband Internet through cell phones. Um, that's the main thing we didn't have back then that would have been available to us on a mobile basis. Uh, we had some satellite units back then, but those were not very useful. They're very slow on the internet. Actually, it was dial-up. It still had dial-up uh, internet, right? We had dial-up internet. 
You'd have to dial a, a phone number, an 800 number with your phone. Right. But you'd need a phone line. Right. Which we which didn't, have. didn't have. We, we, we did get some a little later on. There's but, a story about that, yeah. too. Yeah, we've got some inter- I know you have an interesting story we want to share with, with our audience. But, um, you know, the funny part about it is when it comes to radios and that kind of communication, that isn't all that different today. Public safety radio, you still have to have a system in place. Uh, radios, you know, fire police, uh, first responders of various kinds, they still carry radios. They still work pretty much the same way. They have a lot more capability now than they had then, but we weren't looking for a lot of capability. We just needed basic communications. Right. So we had to establish something. We can't use, we couldn't use the New York fire and police systems. I don't even know what state their systems were in at that point. I know they had quite a bit of damage yeah. because the World Trade Center was one of their main sites. Right. So they lost a lot of capability down there when the towers came down. Yeah. So. And uh, uh, what I'm going to ask you, uh, you gentlemen, to do now, I'm going to ask our, our uh, director, Robert, to uh, show us some images. First of all, let, let's look at that, that one image that I think is burned. That, that's sort of, that's when the, the plane hit the second tower and that, that kind of, I think everybody in the country has seen that image at one time or another. And that, that's, and you can see the debris and the, and the, and the, the flames. Um, let, let's go to the second image, uh, Robert. So, so this is. Uh, tell us, tell us what's going on here. This is um, from. That's one of Bill Yee's photos, by the way. He and he couldn't make it today, but Bill had to go to New Jersey to get some radios, right? Okay. And so he took a picture from New. That's I think, believe New Jersey. Looking back. Yeah. That and was, that's Ground Zero in the background, and the smoke that's driving on probably day two or three. Yeah. Okay, and that's across the Hudson River there, of yes. course, from, from New Jersey all across to, uh, uh, to Manhattan. Okay, and Robert, could you uh, bring up the next uh, image, please? So um, what are we looking at here? It looks like a lot of communications vehicles here with satellite and so forth. What, what can you tell it's us West about Side this? Drive, I think, right, going down? Yeah, yeah you get, I, I don't know them. I wasn't there for this photo. I, is, that's all the broadcast remote. So okay. we were on a, on a stage. There's four sides to the World Trade Center, kind of. There's the West Side Drive side, which had all the cameras and the okay. TV and everything. That was on the west, uh, the west side of it. We were on the uh, east side, and the east yeah. side was pretty quiet. Quiet. It was very good because we could do a lot of stuff. They let us do a lot of stuff. We didn't have a lot of interference and stuff. At night, Charlie was on night, so you could do anything at night, right? Night was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's nobody. Yeah. No one was on days. We, we pretty well, we split into that pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Charlie was a night person. I was a day person. And uh, we worked here quite, quite a while, quite a lot. Yep. Uh, and uh, the next image, please, Robert. Mm. Too many buttons to push in there, I think. There we go. Okay. What building is that, Charlie? That's the uh, that is the West Street Telephone Central Office. That's uh, I guess that would be would have been Verizon at the time, New York Telephone originally. So that's that is the nerve center of communications for Wall Street yeah. in that whole area, and that was badly damaged by the uh, was it the tower or the small building that fell? One of the smaller buildings. Well, I think Building Seven was next to it, but yeah, the, yeah. yeah. And the main damage was the, the water mains broke and filled the whole. Basement, the whole yeah. basement, which is all the phone lines, which at the time were not all. There's some, yeah. So you face you face some pretty formidable challenges there, trying to set up communications and so forth. So let's take a look at the the next image, Robert, please. Uh, and that looks like a young. That's Charlie. that's yeah, that's Charlie <laughs> and Bill. Um, Twenty years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, and next to one of our surplus trucks, <laughs> they got us down here. Yeah. 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 And that's Javits, I think. That's the Javits, Javits. Center. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe you can tell us the the, the story that you you relayed a little bit uh, earlier about um, communication, because the personnel, all the people, were at the Javits that set up for you, and uh, of course that you were what a couple miles from Ground Zero, right. and there that's was right. no way to communicate. But you kind of found a way. Tell us. That's a very interesting story. Yeah, we had shifts. We had several shifts, right? A day and night shifts. Yeah. So we had guys down at Ground Zero, but we're all back at Javits. We needed to find a way to talk to them. So how are we going to do this? So we thought across the city, all those buildings, no way we're going to be able to do anything simple. So I went up on the roof with a portable, uh, similar to that one, yeah, and put it on the channel the guys were using down at Ground Zero, and lo and behold, I could hear them all talking down there, and I could talk to them. So that was... 
that was like our first gift of luck. So, so and, and this was just kind of serendipitous. You weren't expecting to... Uh, I didn't expect that we would be able to talk from there at all to yeah. Ground Zero. It just happened the buildings lined up just the right way. You, couldn't see, you couldn't see Ground Zero from there. So, but, uh, so this is now, now. Tell us about the. This this is a pretty old unit. Now tell us. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us what we're looking at here. So that's a Motorola MX. That was the, that was the, highest end radio that came out in the 1970s. Yeah. When I first started in the business, that yeah. was the. Yeah, and this is yeah. pretty hefty. It's pretty yes. pretty heavy. It's not not a, something you can just slip into your pocket easily. No. You know, you had to wear that on a, usually either on a pack up here or on a. A belt holster, and and we got those surplus. They weren't new to us. Uh, they came from the uh, the Secret Service in Boston. Accessed eighty five radios, and we took in. Yeah, yeah. Charlie was able to fix them all, <laughs> and uh, worked in the yeah. yeah. Bill uh, Bill worked on those. Bill and I both had experience in the business working on those, yeah. so we made extensive use of those. But yeah. and of course there was there was no broadband back then. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no. but you forgot the second half. Oh, here we you, go. Yeah, he can talk from the here, ceiling. You can talk from the roof of Ground Zero, but how do you get the guys down on the first floor? So I'll, I'll hold this up and you can tell us what we're, what we're looking so, at. So, uh, well, this is the good part. Well, or the best part was we had that luck of being able to talk from the roof. But then, the, then how do we make that useful to the guys downstairs on the first floor? So we took a mobile radio, a little mobile radio, connected it to that. That's called a poor man's remote. It was just a way in the old days of taking a mobile radio and making it so you could run it remotely over a wire or a phone line or something from a long distance away. And we hooked that to the mobile. We put an antenna on the roof. Uh, one of the guys at Javis gave us a pair of wires going down to the first floor, coming up out of the floor near Eddie Seligman, who was our logistics manager's desk. Yeah. We put a little telephone desk set on his desk, and lo and behold, there's Eddie he can talk to the guys at Ground Zero. That was so, step one. So this is an antique, right? It is. It this is. is a, this is, so so there's a, a, a transformer, transformer there. there. A relay. A relay yeah. and a and a trans capacitor. Yeah. And a capacitor. Yeah. So it's a simple, simple, very old-fashioned device. They probably made that thing for fifty years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who made? No, who made? Motorola. This? Motorola. Motorola. Yeah. 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 And uh, we were the only people that could talk for a while. Yeah. Except everybody could finally kind of duplicate what Charlie did. And yeah, they had more complicated equipment to do it. Yeah, but it's a, we were the only purple diaries. Yeah. And how are you making it? Well, I'll just talk to Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, now what, uh, what, what sort of your, the speeds available back uh, back 20 years ago were not what they are today, right? What what, were, what kind of speeds? Uh, 1200 baud, right? Maybe well, it was a little better than 12. I think then wasn't it 56k by yeah, that? Yeah, I think maybe do 56. 2000. So if you could get a phone line, you could uh, talk, you could dial a good, it up. A good phone line, yeah, yeah. Don't forget the pictures also were a lot smaller back then. A great yeah. picture is 300k, right? Yeah. Now they're three megs, megs or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And the other thing we, we we lucked out because we were down at Ground Zero and nobody had any phones. And one day, the fire department had a couple of phones in their tent. I said, "Where'd those guys get those phones?" He said, "Well, you got to talk to this guy." So I got this little guy come over. He said, "Do you want a phone?" He said, "I said, well, sure." He worked for the uh, Transit, Transit the Authority, MTA. So That's they a, they had lines under the ground that didn't get affected. They were in the Transit Authority. Oh. Okay. So he uh, he cut off four extensions for us. I think we were at some state, some we were stationed something or other. But we got their telephone lines. He got us some uh, lines that worked on. Uh, uh, we could dial up out of there, and dial eight, and you could dial the country out of there. It was really good. Yeah. And yep. uh, yeah, they had their own. Their line still worked. Fortunately, yeah. they provided their own. And they probably had a central office from somewhere else, right? Or their own. Yeah. Oh. So, so several of these things that, that came to fruition were just kind of lucky kind of things where you met this guy from the subway system yeah. and you were up on the roof up there looking yeah. at the stars and you could, <laughs> you could hear the, the folks right. at Ground Zero. So they were kind of serendipitous that you were able to... No, you have to look for those things. Right? Yeah, that's there's right. a difference between there's lucky people. The... You know, some people, you know, it's not all luck. You know, you get a smile, you get to know yeah. what you're doing. And we had we'd got a good relationship going with the guys in the building, right? Yes. They got us water for showers, and we went phone lines. You go back to the same guy, and we, I'm sure we took care of them too, right? I mean, of course. I guess those guys were running around with FEMA shirts on after a while. And, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so we, we had some very good friends. So if you make friends with the people that know what they're doing, you're all set. There you go. Now, now Charlie, how long, uh, how long did you spend uh, at Ground Zero? 
You said. About a week, right? Eight days. Eight days. Eight days. Yeah. So you were part of the 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 the, the uh, task force one group that was yeah. spent eight days first one day down and eight days later, uh, uh, eight days later come we back. We went down Tuesday. Now, did, did you guys yeah. ever yeah. go back uh, again to to uh, to Ground Zero after after that deployment? Uh, no, um, maybe. When, when did uh, Barack Obama get elected? What year was that? Eight, two thousand eight. So, so in 2007, there was the uh, election was coming up. We were doing a hurricane mission down in Florida. On the way back, we stopped, and we just happened to be there on September 11th. And we, we had the team, and I don't know if Charlie wasn't on the team at the time, right? No. And we just stopped, and we visited there the night before. And the, the day of the 12th, we, we stayed in New Jersey because you couldn't get in. The Obama was in there, and uh, where was we running against at the time? Uh, anyhow, they had... Everybody was making a big pitch at Ground Zero, so we didn't go in. We just stayed over yeah. in New Jersey and yeah. honored them from New Jersey. Yeah, all right. And, Robert, do we have a, another image here? I don't know how I lost track of which one we were on. Oh, sure, that's all right. Uh, so tell us what... That's the front of the same building. Let's jump to the next one. It's not very interesting. It was just... Okay. That's the telephone, the other okay. side of the telephone okay. business. That's uh, a billion that's in the next building. Right? And that's a Century 21 department store, which... That's where our, our, our boo was, our base of operations. Yeah. In the back side, is they, the, the box is Nextel on it, and they were able to put a small repeater in there or something, right? A booster. Ne the next Nextel came and did that. And, uh, they got our Nextels working for a while. And then that's before we had our tent right there. Yeah. I think there's a picture of the tent coming up, too. Yeah. yeah. And is there, is there another image, Robert, or, or not? There, okay. Oh, there's Charlie on day one. Okay. There's... Got his, yeah, that's, before, that's before I went on the night shift. That's right. Where we divvied it up. All of our green boxes. And, yep. what, and what's, in, what's in those boxes? Everything though? and anything. Yeah. You know, the different... So they have, those have red tape, and this uh, communications has green tape, and yeah. medical has... I forgot. They're all different disciplines. So. And actually, we use the boxes to make a little Ford Apache. Yes. People are going so crazy, we just stack the boxes up, and we could work inside the boxes. Yeah, yeah. initially down there, it was wide open. They didn't hadn't locked the site down. There yeah. was everybody. I think that's that same day. There's there. everybody's on there. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you? I mean, th there must have been uh, all kind of other people trying to do the same thing you were doing. And I mean, uh, how 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 could you? Uh, uh, was there somebody that was in charge of like uh, all the communications that kind of said you do this, you do that, or was it? We, sort of no, we had our of? each team had their own you know leader. Yeah. And uh, so. You know, FEMA was doing some communications coordination from the IST level, which yeah. is the next level above the teams. Is that the right, yes. right way of saying But you have to remember, lots of IST people got to fly in. No planes were flying. Yeah, so right. unless the guy could drive there. No guy from California was a calm guy at the time. He couldn't get there. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, everybody was on their own probably the first three or four days. Yeah. Right. And, and the nearest other... Um, uh, a FEMA location or task force location, what, what is either, what is it? Well, there's one in New York, and they were obviously wiped out. There right. was one in Pennsylvania, and they couldn't get through because the river, they, all the tunnels were right? shut. That was Philadelphia, right? Yeah. That's yeah. One in Philadelphia, right? Okay. There was New Jersey, it's not a, it was not a federal team. Right, they were a state team at the time. Yeah. They got there fairly early, but they were not a federal team. They've since become a federal team mm -hmm. yeah. very recently. Yeah. Well, as far as communications, Charlie, what, what were some of the, the, the takeaways, some of the things that you learned uh, uh, for, for, for the future in terms of communications by, by this episode? Well, one of the things we learned was that uh, when guys were in the, in the buildings, they were the building next to the Century 21 department store, they were searching that floor to floor and looking in every apartment. It was an apartment building because they wanted to see if anybody was trapped in there because the elevators were yeah. out of commission. And they couldn't talk to each other between the floors. So I sat outside and talked to each of them and relayed for and them. relayed back and forth. Because wow. they didn't have any. So that's one of the things you learn is you, you may have to relay for people who don't have communications. Um, and we put a repeater up to cover directly down at Ground Zero, but that didn't work well enough for them in that building. And... Uh, what else? Uh, Most of the re our gear was foresters type gear for repeaters and stuff, and they were made for working in an area where there wasn't much noise. Out in the open. and Yeah, you get up on yeah. top of the, they sent you on top of the Western Union building, right? Yeah. 
and everybody in the world is transmitting up there, so yeah, interference and the yeah. noise floor. Yeah. I don't up. remember how we ended up on the Western Union, but we were looking for a tall building down near Ground Zero for the repeater. Yeah. And I think Mark arranged it somehow. And I don't know. Somebody did. Somebody did, and that's, that's where we ended up. But yeah. Now, um, let's talk about uh, what's happening now uh, at, uh, at your facility yeah. uh, on uh, September 9th. 10th. Eleventh. Uh, Eleventh. Okay. Sorry, nine eleven. Sure. There you go. That's okay. <laughs> it's nine eleven, not eleven nine, right? Um, so there's going to be a commemorative uh, ceremony. Yes. Uh, on the twentieth anniversary of, of the event we're talking about here, uh, and it's going to be uh, as, as you go in. It's, it's forty forty three Airport Drive for for the, the airport address, road. Yeah, on airport the way to the road. airport. And just before you get to the airport proper, turn off to the right there. So uh, there's going to be a series of uh, there's going to be. A, Ceremony with some speakers. Tell us, tell us about the, the, uh, the speakers. Well, we're going to have some politicians and some people speak, some veterans speak, and then we're going to. It's a typical um, memorial ceremony. There'll be some speeches by people. We'll have some bagpipe band. We'll fly over by the National Guard, and uh, that should last about forty-five minutes to an hour. After that, we have the place open. We're going to have an open house. We're going to have some of the radio equipment we had back then. Everybody can look and play with it. We're going to have the uh, dogs are going to be there. We have uh, uh, our museum. There's a 9-11 museum that opened with you that day. We have uh, some of the people demonstrating equipment we had. We have some military equipment there. And it's going to be an open house. And everybody can come and see what we do and talk to some of the people who have been there on 9-11, that were there on 9-11, some of the people that are there today that are not 9-11 people that are still doing the same job that we did down there. Yeah. So for people that are going to uh, go there, you go to the airport road, and there'll be some parking. There's a big, some big soccer fields there before you get to your... You do like to say, they follow the crowd. They'll all be park. walking in. And, and so you'll be able to park. The public will be able to park and then walk into the... Because I don't think you have enough uh, parking within the facility for all the cars you're expecting. And then uh, the, the uh, actual ceremonies. And there, there's a flyby. You mentioned that. Uh, rather quickly, but there's, the National Guard will have a flyby yeah. during during that, and there'll be uh, the, the the formal ceremonies and afterwards for people who want to look around. One of the things you have there, Mark, you might have mentioned, is an old missile silo back from the Cold War days, from the fifties. Tell tell us about that. Well, that place originally was a, a Nike site. They used to actually after the World War II, there was always a chance somebody was going to bomb us, and I don't. They always thought the Russians were going to come. So right after where they had uh, um, sky sky sweeper anti-aircraft guns, but they rapidly got replaced by missiles. And the first missiles that came out were Nike Hercules missiles. They were about 15 miles. And they had 12 of these bases around Boston, circling Boston, because we had certain critical infrastructure in Boston. They wanted us to to, um, protect. So one of those sites was in Beverly. On the top of the water tower, where the water tower is now, there was a radar site. And where we are, there was a missile site. And the missiles were kept underground. So we luckily we have a missile. It's the second generation of Hercules missile. We have a little trailer and we have a piece of radar. We'll have a little site set up on it. As you come in, you'll see what it was back then. Yep. We also give a tour of the underground site where you could go where they launch with site. Yeah. In the main storage building where they stored the missile underground. Yeah. That, if, for those of you who haven't been there, it's quite, a, quite an exciting thing. It's, it's eye-opening when you see that underground uh, big cavernous uh, open uh, mm. space where the, where the missiles were were staged and also stored. Correct? Yeah, yes. Yeah, they were. And uh, you uh, and um, uh, the flyby will will be happening. And then afterwards, I might mention that uh, the, this whole program and this uh, ceremony is uh, uh, being sponsored by Mark's group, the Task Force Number One, uh, as well as Historic Beverly, uh, mm. as well as the city uh, city of Beverly, and that will be. Uh, uh, people from those organizations plus Rotary who will be acting as uh, volunteers and guides for people who want to sure. guide around the... Well, Phase Group is doing a very good job. They're doing some research on things. I'm even learning things. <laughs> she publishes these. He's going to be publishing a series of articles on yeah. civil defense and, and the emergency management and how we got to be a team and and how it works and the whole thing. So she's doing, doing a very right. nice and, job. And I, I might mention that... that uh, um, uh, we're referring to Faye Salt, who is uh, with the uh, with Historic Beverly. She's on the board of directors there, and she's uh, uh, going to be writing these articles. And we'll, you'll be seeing them <clears> in the paper as well. And my, I might also mention that BevCam will be there, and we will be uh, broadcasting the ceremonies live uh, on our channel. 
and we will also be streaming them live uh, on uh, on YouTube and on our on our website. Uh, we have the capability uh, to do that, and we're still trying to negotiate with the airport to see if we can get a, a little drone up there. But we we haven't. Not yet, huh? Haven't haven't confirmed that. Uh, Did you have any more pictures up there? I thought there was one of the tent we were in there with the te- telephones and all that stuff. Any any other pictures? Do uh, we have any more? See if the control room can bring it up. I saw it. We were here. Oh, Tommy Carr. Yeah, Tom's on the phone talking to somebody. Yeah, is there any more? Any more? There we go. Oh, there Tom we go. Carr. Okay. So there's a, a push button telephone and a fax machine and a computer that's dialed up. And Tom Carr's a planning guy and he's working on his. Uh, um, Report, I guess. Yeah, and that, that's one of your, your folks, right, Tom? Oh, sure, Tom. Yeah, yeah he's in the, in the Navy now, and he's in the um, uh, Seabees or something like that. He's a Corps of Engineers. He's done very well in the Navy. He's a very dedicated civilian that came down there. Nice, yeah. nice guy. All right. And are there any more images, Robert? I wanna, okay, so that's the, the last image we have. So yeah. um, what I'd, like to, I'd like to then say that um, we also have um, a website uh, this is your, oh, sure. your website. Let's put that up. Um, www.matf.org. And if you do go on that website, right on the home page, front page, there's a big article and all the information that you could possibly want about about the event that's happening uh, on 9-11. So that'll give you the times and, and everything that's uh, happening. Anybody wants to watch it, there's the, the premier one shows uh, Laurel Sweet from the Boston Herald. There's... Two reporters went down. Bar- Laurel Sweet from the Herald went down, and Carrie Lee Halkett from Fox 25 News. And we gave, they got embedded with us, and FEMA okayed it. They were the only photographers at Ground Zero for days. Okay. And uh, Laurel Sweet, who was, uh, uh, does a uh, story about with Tom Kenny looking for my brother. Tom Kenny died two years ago from cancer related to 9 11. But his brother did a, a movie about 10 years ago. It's a very nice movie. It's very, you've seen the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's very captures the some of the stuff we said very succinctly. Yeah, and and where can that be accessed on YouTube? Oh, you know, you just go to www.matf.org first. Oh, it's on the website. It's on the website. You just click on it, and away you go. There's okay. also a couple other good things on there. We're going to put some more up there. But uh, I'd just say, anybody watch, watch, looking for my brother, that captures the moment exactly. And there's a phone number there, and that's that's your switchboard number. So. Yes, it's our switchboard. If you need anything, I can't think of. And and this is a this is a free event. There's no there's oh, no no, no money at all. No, this is this is a free event, and and everybody uh, the the public is uh, absolutely is, is invited. So we will, we want to make sure we. So Mark, again, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for sponsoring these for for being here, and uh, Charlie Charlie Dunn, thank you for giving us some insight into. Uh, into how the communications worked or didn't work or, <laughs> or you made work. Here, though. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. And I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.